What's going on everyone? Today we're here with Janice. Now Janice has been doing videos on YouTube for a very long time, at least that I have been viewing. I'm a subscriber. Uh, she go by Janice J Nice on YouTube. Make sure you go search out her channel. Please subscribe. Now the reason why we brought Janice on today, Janice just made a video on her channel and she was referencing African immigrants. And she was speaking about how they come to this country and are very successful. And some of them, not all, have a certain attitude toward African Americans. We want to explore a little bit more about that. So Janice, thank you for coming to the show. Thank you so much for having me on your show. And I've been a subscriber of the years for a while now. So I'm really excited to talk about this topic. It's something that I'm um, passionate about. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, Janice, Part of what we're trying to do here is bring global African unity. And so what you was talking about, we got to deal with this. So Janice, explain to the audience that don't know much about you, uh, some of your background and some of your upbringing. Okay. Um, so I am, I was born and raised it. Well, I, I moved around a lot growing up. Um, but my parent, both of my parents are from Cameroon which is Western Central Africa, right next to Nigeria. Um, so my parents both came here in their uh, 20s and I was born here, raised here, but um, they, you know, I have a lot of knowledge about our Cameroonian culture. And um, so currently I am uh, studying to get my PhD in um, organizational psychology. So um, I stum when I stumbled upon this article, I, at first I didn't really believe it um, because I, it just didn't sound like it was true. It, it kind of sounded like one of those fake news stories. Um, but when I, I did more digging, I actually realized that the, the article was, you know, cited reputable studies. So it was, it was really interesting. Um, so that's originally where my interest about the article stemmed from. Um, so that's a little bit of my background. Do you want me to get into um, some of what the article was saying? Well, first of all, we need to know where did this article come from? Okay, so it was a Bloomberg article, um, I believe from 2015. Um, and they cited a study, one or two studies um, within the article. Um, and I'm pulling it up now. They cited one or two studies um, about uh, just immigrants and they're comparing different immigrant groups and their income um, within the United States. So in your findings on this article, what were you surprised by? Uh, honestly, you know, I had actually, I follow a lot of like um, pro-black and pan-African pages on Instagram. And originally I saw that on one of the pages, they posted that um, either they said West African or Nigerian immigrants in this country have more wealth than other immigrant groups and even whites. And, you know, I, at first, honestly, when I saw that, I didn't believe it. And I was talking to my mom on the phone and I just told her, oh, you know, I read this. Um, I saw this page on Instagram and they said, and my mom was like, oh yeah, definitely it's true. You know, so I didn't believe it. So I actually Googled it and that's when I stumbled upon the Bloomberg article um, and then I looked at the sources that they were citing within the article and it looked legit, you know? So I, I was just surprised, I guess, because in my mind that I know this is a stereotype and a misconception, you know, Asians are like the model minority and we see Asians as, you know, Asians are the smartest is the perception. So I felt like Asians would be the most prosperous immigrant group. I didn't really think that it would be Africans or West Africans or whatever. Um, so I was shocked by that simply because I feel like there's more Chinese people, there's more Indian, Indian. So in my mind, I felt like they would have, a, you know, their, those immigrants would be more prosperous in this country. Now let me ask you a question. Why did you think that? What, 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 well, let me rephrase that. What shaped your mind to think that? Um, I guess because of just looking at the, the population, um, you know, Chinese and uh, Indians have the highest population. And I just, in my mind, I feel like there's a lot of Chinese or Asian in general 
Um, but a lot of like Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Indian immigrants in college, you know, and my sister went to Yale. And when we were at her, her graduation, it was like every name that they were calling was foreign, was some type of, it sounded like Chinese or Japanese or some oriental type of last name. So it just seems like there's a, you know, Asians are prospering in college. So I just assume they have a larger population. They have a lot of Asian immigrants that come into this country. So I just assume that they were more prosperous um, simply because they have larger numbers than Africans. Okay, so let's speak on the stereotypes that African immigrants, some, I'm going to say some, not all, some African immigrants feel about African Americans. What are these stereotypes? So I'm going to be 1,000% honest with you, you know, and this is, you know, the, the, I, I feel like this is the way that we bridge the, the gap is by talking about you know what it is and this is the truth honestly so i would say that off my guess 90 percent of first generationers so people whose parents are african and were but they themselves were born here i would say as far as my female friends um i would say about 90 percent of their parents do not want them dating someone who's black you know and i think that in their parents' minds, they have these misconceptions about black people based on what they see in the media. Um, and a lot of these African parents have not ever interacted with black people outside of maybe work. And a lot of Africans honestly experience discrimination from sadly our own people. So I think it's a combination of what we see in the media and then, you know, what what African immigrants experience, which, you know, their perception of blacks is that they're lazy, you know, they always have their hand out, they are, um, they're not ambitious, you know, they're on welfare. So a lot of this, this rhetoric that is put forth by white people about blacks is, is a lot of what Africans adopt. And there's this disassociation, Africans don't see themselves as black, you know? It's, it's like, oh, I'm not black, that, that's those are, you know, that's those people. But to white people, we're the same, we're one and the same, we're all the same people. White people don't really differentiate between, oh, Nigerian and black and this and that. So I think that a lot of these negative perceptions about black people, Africans have adopted for whatever reason. So a lot of African parents don't want their daughters dating or marrying black guys. There's this perception particularly about black men that they're, you know, they're going to be absent fathers and they're not going to be faithful. So I think a lot of it is goes back to the pressure that is put on the parents to, you know, and it transfers and trickles down to the children. So what you're saying is the perception Africans, some, let me say some Africans have of black people here is basically birth off of anti-black propaganda yes yes definitely i think that that's a large part of it also you know both my parents you know anyone who meets my parents they have very thick accents my dad's accent he's clearly african um and my mom people always think she's caribbean i guess i don't know why but um you know both of them i witnessed them experiencing discrimination and more so my mom, you know, has to deal with not only being a woman, but being not only being black, but being an immigrant woman with an accent, you know, and I just hear when people speak with me, the manner in which they speak to me is completely different from how they speak to her. And they like talk to her like she's slow because she has an accent, you know? So I feel like what my mom has experienced and what a lot of immigrant African immigrants experience is like they expect their own people to embrace them. And it's like, I'm black, you're black, but it's like such a shock when your own people are not really embracing you the way that you think that they should. Yes. Now I want to ask you a series of questions just based off of everything you said. Let's go back to talk about the lazy part. Um, and okay. you said you talk about the handouts and the food stamps and welfare. Do they actually know the numbers when it comes to welfare and food stamps? Who's receiving what? Uh, definitely not. You know, 
from my understanding, it's whites who are who are receiving welfare and food stamps more than any other group. But I think there's just this perception that it's it's the black mothers, the single black mothers that have their hand out, you know, and it's it's all perception. It's definitely not reality, and they don't take the time to really educate themselves. They just you know, base it off of what they think and what they hear from their friends. So there isn't a lot of research that's being done. Yeah, because, you know, well, let's be, you know, accurate. Yes, the white community do receive the most in food and that to 39 percent of the cases and blacks are 26, 27 percent. When it comes to welfare, blacks receive 39.7 percent and whites 38.7 percent. So whites and blacks are even on welfare, believe it or not. Just the food stamps are just a little bit more. But if they even knew that, and also if they knew that more black people were in college than they are in prison, how could they actually be lazy? Yeah, exactly. It's it's a matter of not really looking into the facts and then just going off the perception. And a lot of it's like media, what you see in the media. Um, you know, so it's like you see that the, the, the perception of the black man in the media is that he's the absent father, the perception of of the black woman is also a negative, you know, it's it's primarily negative. So it's like, this is what we see. And if, if you yourself don't have a lot of uh, black friends, you just kind of go off of what you hear and what you see um, on TV. Now, once again, and I'm, I'm keep addressing facts because our people has been so hoodwinked with anti-black propaganda and they accept it as fact and it's done on purpose. For instance, when you talk about the black father, do you know the CDC put out that the black father spend more time in, in the life of his children more than any other group? I didn't know that. I've never heard that fact before. Yes, black men are heavy in their children's lives. Um, so these people constantly put out a lot of negative about black people and that's why I fight so hard to combat the anti-black propaganda, because what you're telling me, that's preventing us from unifying. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So I think that part, uh, like I said, a large part of it is the media, but I think another part of it is just, I don't know why for whatever reason, um, but what a lot of Africans experience when they come here is like, they expect to be embraced by blacks, but you know, that embrace isn't always there. And oftentimes black people are the first to point out that Africans are different, you know? So it's like, you don't, you don't feel unified with people when it feels like you're not, you're not part of them, you know? And, and, and as an example, this is a very like benign example, but when I was in um, college, I never really told people my parents were from Cameroon, you know? So a lot of people just assumed that I was black or I was mixed or whatever. And in college, I was more like, um, I was more proud of my heritage. So I would tell people all the time, oh, you know, Cameroon, my parents are from Cameroon. And when people would meet my parents, they would hear the accent. And I had a lot of black friends in, in undergrad. And when I would tell them things like, oh, you know, I've never, um, watched, I'd never seen a Medea movie. I didn't know how to play spades. Just like the stereotypical things that black, I didn't really like watermelon. The stereotypical things that black people did. It was like, they would jokingly say to me, girl, you ain't black for real. You know, and it was like, I would hear that constantly. And I had Ethiopian friends and they would say the same things to them. And it's like, yeah, it's funny and it's all jokes and ha 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 ha. But if you really think about if that's the constant rhetoric that you're hearing, how that makes you feel subconsciously. Like you laugh and it's a joke, but at the same time, when you start hearing something over and over and over again, you start to believe it and adopt it. So if people are telling you constantly, you're not black. It's like you separate yourself subconsciously or unconsciously from this group of people that you are part of. So I think that while part of it is the stereotypes and the things that are seen in the media, Another part of it is, you know, the fact that for whatever reason, blacks, some blacks point out the fact that Africans are different, you know? So it makes us feel like these people are not, we're part of you, I'm, we're the same people. Why are you not embracing me? But what the, I feel what they're saying and they just addressing it the wrong way. And I did a live stream called the black police and I have a thing with black people trying to run around policing who's black or not. Like, who are you? But yeah. I think what they're referencing is 
our culture is different. Yeah. Because yeah, which I'm totally, I totally agree with the things that I, you know, I didn't grow up with a lot of uh, my, the, the music that's, you know, the like Stevie wonder and the Marvin get my parents didn't listen to that, mm-hmm. you know? So it's like, there's a whole, like, even the music is different. And, you know, I have, I have friends who grew up on that type of Al Green and all of the, that type of music. And I just was like, I don't know. I like it, but I, I don't have the same appreciation for it. We grew up, our, our value and our culture is different, you know, but it's, it's one thing to say that and that, you know, versus to say, it's almost like you're not one of us. You're not black for real. It's like, okay, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But now you, you referenced something earlier that people who come from the continent of Africa, you can't get no more African than that. Why would they come over and feel they're not black? Um, it's, it's crazy. It's just the perception that is, you know, thrown in the media. It's just like, you're not one of, it's funny. My, my relatives all love Donald Trump. And I'm like, are you stupid? Do you not know? Like, like they have this idea that Donald Trump is going to save black people because black people in America somehow need saving this is what a lot of africans think and believe and it's like we're not we're different we're african they're black you know they're lazy they're they're on food stamps they're on welfare fathers aren't there this and that you know they have children out of wedlock and all of this is just like the negative things that you know um a lot of africans actually watch um what is it love and hip-hop so i know that many african cameroonians i see them on snapchat and on instagram posting things about love and hip hop. And I'm like, these are Africans that have never been to America. So I'm like, if love and hip hop is the mark of what is blackness, I could see how you could watch that and laugh and disassociate yourself from it because it's like, why are these people behaving in this way? So I think a lot of it's what they see on TV, you know, and it's like, that's not me, that's shameful behavior. And it's like, I don't wanna, I'm not that, that's not me. That's black people. I'm African, you know? Once again, they perception of us is anti-black propaganda. VH1 is owned by what company? Viacom. Who owns Viacom? Not yeah. black people. So exactly. they will use a black woman to make exactly. money off of exploiting black people. And, and these black people go on this show on their own. Nobody's making yeah. them do it. Of and course. It's like, who's really at fault? Is it Mona Scott Young? Is it... You know, if you're a struggling black artist and you need money, you know, I would never be on that show, but I don't blame them for, for you know, you need money, you have mouths to feed, you have to do what you have to do. But then it's almost like who's really at fault. Mona Scott Young would not be who she is if we as black people were not watching that show. So it's almost like the, I made a video a long time ago about world star hip hop and I didn't really know who was at fault because I feel like the website is so shameful, you know? And, but it's like, is it the, this black man who started the website who's at fault? Or is it us, the consumers? Because without this, without us, this website would be nothing. It's almost like who is really at fault or to blame? Yes, yeah, it, it goes back to the old school uh, supply and demand, you know, that bought in business. Um, yeah. they demand the ratchetness. They demand all this sort of topics. Why do we demand the ratchetness? <laughs> Unfortunately, Janice, I don't know. And, 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 and they make it hard to put up positive content. If you think about it, Janice, you can make a video right now and talk about, uh, how to fix your credit, or you could yeah. talk about maybe buying stocks on the stock market or buying a home and then make a video about some ratchet female or ratchet guy and just watch the views. Nobody's going to watch the video to educate them, but they're going to watch the ratchet. This is what people in America want to watch. Yeah. So it's like, do you, you know, it, it's like, who really is? I can't even be mad at Mona because if she's not doing it, somebody else is going to do it. Yeah. It's, it's what we want to watch until we put our foot down and say, we don't want, but at the same time, we don't even know subconsciously what this is doing to us. It's separating us because there is that divide. I've had friends that tell me their parents would be more upset with them dating a black person, African girls, than dating a white person. You see, which to me is like very backward. 
But what you just said, and, and, and I'm address some issues that, that I have seen as a black American with a lot of African people. What you said earlier about they like Donald Trump and they feel Donald Trump needs to save black people. The problem is a lot of Africans have this self-hate and white savior mentality when yet the white man has been raping, pillaging, and stealing from Africa forever. Okay. And they are so much so on self-hate that the skin lightning business in, in a lot of African nations are making billions and black women in America are lightening their skin like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's sad in, in Cameroon, they have billboards of skin lightning creams. And my cousins said to me, you know, like, what do you put on your skin? It's so smooth. And my mom was like, you know why they're asking you that, right? And I was like, because they think my skin is smooth. And she's like, no, they think you lighten your skin. So they're asking, what do you put on it so that their skin can be like yours? And it's it's like, why do we, it's the, the amount of brainwashing that has been done to us black people, Africans run so deep that it's like, I don't even know where to begin to undo everything that's been done to us. Because it's like, there's a separation. You don't see the separation with any other group of people, but with black people, you don't see, the the Jews in Israel and the Jews here being like, oh, they're not, they're different. We're not, you know, we're not Israeli Jews. We're American Jews. You don't see, you know, Italians in America saying, oh, we're not like, you know, you don't see that with any other group, but with blacks and Africans. There's this like, oh, I'm not them, they're not me type of thing. And even with black people, it's this funny thing like, oh, you're an African booty scratcher. You know, people don't really, I guess, say that anymore, but there's this idea. I saw this episode, I was actually watching it with my mom of Real Housewives of Atlanta. And sometimes I used to watch this with my mom and she, you know, she, we would laugh. In this episode, they went to Africa, somewhere in Africa, I think South Africa or Kenya or somewhere. And they were Phaedra or one of the characters was like, are we gonna get on elephants and giraffe like just this idea of like africa that people have is a very small-minded and ignorant view of africa and my mom was watching it with me and she just was like can you turn that off this is just ridiculous these women are so ignorant you know and it's it's like it's it's on both sides but it's like how do we undo and fix this when it's like among africans it's just like you don't mingle you don't procreate with black people but it's like, we're the same people. Why is it like this? And how do we undo what's all this damage that's already been done? Well, for me, I see the solution as destroying anti-black propaganda. And you was asking earlier, why all these other groups don't feel that way? Well, if you do the research, anti-black propaganda has been going on ever since they had a print media. You haven't seen uh, anti-Asian propaganda every single day. You haven't seen anti-Italian propaganda every single day or German Americans versus Germans over there in their own country. I mean, the propaganda is so thick because they don't want us to get together. That, that's what the thing is. They fear us really unifying and getting together because they know we can do when we unify. They fear that. So they gotta keep us, Janice, separated. Yeah. And we're like sitting here like debating light skin, dark skin, like we're black to all of them. I, you know, you know, honestly, Phil, the first time I realized I was light skin, it was when I was at a black school. When I was growing up, I grew up until I was 16. I went to all white schools and I knew I was black. You know, I thought I was brown and I was like, why do they call me black? I'm brown, but I knew I was black. And then when I went to a black high school, that's when they were like, yo, red bone, light skin, this, that. I was like, oh, I'm light skin? Oh, I guess I'm light skin. That's not something that was, I was made aware of until I was in a black school. How ironic. White people weren't sitting here saying, you're light skin, you're this, you're that. It was my own people pointing out something that made me, I guess, in a sense, different from some of them. Yes. How do we, it's so deep. It's just like, how do we, how do we get rid of the anti-black propaganda when black people themselves are participating in, you know, I don't like watching these, these slave movies, for example, I refuse to watch 12 years a slave and movies of that nature. Um, the free state of Joe, I don't like watching those movies and I don't like that. We keep playing into these roles where we're victims. 
You know, we're slaves, we're, we're maids, we're the help. Why do we keep playing into these roles? Because those are the only types of roles that white people award. We win awards, Denzel wins award for training day. He's not gonna win an award for for a book of Eli or any of these movies where he played really well. Will Smith is not gonna win an award for, for you know, so it's just kind of like, we have to really look at our role that we're playing because I, I feel like if none of the black people that are playing in these role, stereotypical roles were doing that, what could they do? They'd have to find white actors, lighten their skin. But it's like the fact that some of our prominent actors are playing into these roles, you know, is kind of, I don't, I, I feel like it's part of the problem. It's definitely part of the problem. I, I've never seen Scandal, but when I heard about the storyline, it, I'll be honest with you, it bothered me. I'm like, okay, so she's like the mistress. The black woman is not good enough to be like somebody's main woman. She's like the mistress. She's like the one that, you know, and it's it's just like we're playing into same with being, um, being Mary Jane, and I love that show, but it just plays into the same rhetoric about black women and about black people. So it's like, how do we stop this? Well, we have to stop playing into it. But how do we, I know it's not that easy. Oh, it is, it's not as difficult as some people make it out to be. Like I said, we, we talked about anti-black propaganda. But the second thing we have to do as black people, let me tell you something, you've been off of Masses Plantation for a while now, but yet a lot of you, I, I, this is my opinion, they can get mad if I want to. I believe 80% of black people are still on Masses Plantation mentally and about 20% of us are free. That's just how I feel about it. Now we can switch that to 80% of us free and 20% on a plantation. We will truly be free. It just how how, we become free? It, it, easy. First of all, we have to accept that we are a slave. The second thing I would say is what you just said about the actors and actresses. Well, they have to play certain parts or they'll get an award. Why is the white man's award validation to you? Why does he have to say, you're good. I'm going to reward you with a Grammy. I'm going to reward you with an Academy Award. Why can't we create our own stuff and say, brother, sister, we thought you did good. That's our problem. Until we remove uh, validating the white man's opinion, uh, want him to give us a thumbs up to say that we are okay, uh, looking at them and their opinion more than your opinion or my opinion or other people in our group's opinion, then we slowly become getting free with a knowledge of self. We're looking at us as a global African diaspora instead of separating. Um, it's more things I go to into that. But once you are free from that, because too many black people is like, I don't know. Listen, they say, if a black person do something, they say, oh man, they embarrassing us. White people going to think this, or oh, man, white people. It's like, you don't never say, well, the Asians going to think this and the Hispanics going to think that. And the Arabs is always white folks. Cause you are a slave. Yeah. The thing we have to do is accept the fact that we are slaves <laughs> mentally some of us no you're absolutely right i saw a lot of i didn't watch the grammys but i saw on instagram a lot of people saying you know beyonce should have won album of the year they just use beyonce for ratings and it goes back to exactly what you're saying is like why are we so thirsty to get you know validation from awards that what is honestly probably all white people that are choosing these awards same mm -hmm. with the oscars why are we so like oscars so white why are we so desperate to get their validation and we're not satisfied with being rewarded and and accepted by our own people you know i don't know if beyonce goes to these black awards shows i really don't know if she how you know how often she's at these other award shows but it's like you're right. It's just nothing is valid until it gets a stamp of approval from white people. And it comes from slave mentality. Even if they say, well, they used her for ratings and she used them for money. So everybody got what they wanted. It's okay to have, make a deal, business deal with white people using each other. It doesn't matter. As long as you get what you want out of it at the end of the day, as long as you don't hurt yourself or sell your people out. But Beyonce got enough awards from white folks. Why, why does she need another one? Yeah. Even if she never get another, another award from white folks. The, the, the woman set. Yeah, absolutely. Our people, you know, a lot of times Janice, you know, we really need to check ourselves that that's our problem. And you, and normally when we have this kind of conversation, Janice, you have these, you know, cause a lot of times the white supremacists, um, are come in and they fear this kind of conversation because they don't want us to put out there how we are slaves in the mind. They don't want to uh, hear, 
us discussing how we can come together on global African unity. They don't want to hear that. They will never tell nobody else, uh, Italian Americans or Italians, uh, not to come together. They will never tell them that, but us, they don't want us together. We have to somehow figure out a way to, to, to be unified, to bust down these stereotypes. Cause these are strongly held stereotypes by, by Africans. It's just like, particularly African fathers just have negative. My dad, you know, and I didn't really introduce my dad to anyone I was dating. Um, but if my dad, you know, saw me dating somebody who was black, it's just kind of like, you know, my parents drilled into my head, honestly, when I was young, um, don't date black men, black men will cheat on you. So it's like, this is what I grew up thinking. And I'm kind of like, you know, and, and this is what many young African girls grow up thinking and they hear this rhetoric from their parents and it's like a black men are absentee fathers. That's the label that is put on black men. So it's like, how do we really shatter these, these stereotypes when they run so deep? You see on TV, the black men play into these stereotypes of being the absentee fathers of being cheaters or being unfaithful, you know? So it's like, it, it's, it's in the music. It's in the, the, the TV. It's in the, the movies, it's in everything. So how do we like undo everything? Because I think a large part of it is what people see on TV. How do we, you know, love and hip hop is gonna keep going. The ratings continue to rise. So it's like, how do we really get people to open their eyes and see the the, the wider effects of, of what being on a show like love and hip hop really does for us as a people? Well, one thing you could do, you could tell a lot of your African friends, why don't you watch programming like mine that goes against that sort of uh, anti-black propaganda and really see how black people really are, how we can articulate ourselves, um, point out who's the true enemy of the world. And it's not the black man and black woman of America. We aren't stealing the resources out of African nations. We aren't uh, colonizing African nations. We aren't uh, putting diseases or uh, tainted by, uh, vaccines in African nations. We, we aren't doing any of that here. You know, so how is it that we're blamed for the most horrible things that we don't do anything to anybody? See, the thing is, your father has this view of black American men, but what men would he want you to date? I'm curious. African men. But African men are, are um, what is it? They believe in, um, is it polygamy? Multiple wives? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so African men are notorious for having multiple wives. So that's something that's accepted and embraced more so in that culture, West African men and even East African men, more so than here in our culture. So it's like you think that black men are going to be unfaithful, yet it's accepted in West African and Cameroonian culture for one man to have multiple wives or mistresses and the wife is expected not to say anything about it. It's backwards if you really think about it. Yeah, I mean, so how are you better when most, the at least the culture, at least even in the black community, for those who are actually in relationships, not a guy that just don't want to settle down, monogamy is usually the way we've always done things here in black American culture. If you study it from, law, from back then to now. So how is it if someone believes in polygamy and having all these different women versus us that believe most of the time in monogamy? And uh, uh, this per it, it's based on these false perceptions because a lot of black men are faithful, but then the, of course you have those those black men who aren't. But I don't think it's anything that's tied to race. I think whites are unfaithful, white men are unfaithful, Spanish men are unfaithful, Asian men are unfaithful. I don't think you can pin that down on just black men, but that's the perception. And I think that part of that perception is that so many, I think the number of black people getting married is, a lot less than other races. So there's this perception that, you know, Don Lemon went on and everyone got mad at him for saying like 78% of black women have uh, children and they're unwed. So it's like, oh, you know, where are the fathers? Just because they're unwed doesn't mean the fathers aren't present in the child's life, but that's the rhetoric that's put up. Why is it that's a huge percentage of, you know, but it's in, in general, people are getting married waiting longer to get married and getting married less and less. So I think that part of that idea that black men are unfaithful is, is the same idea that they're absentee fathers. And they're not necessarily absentee fathers, but they're not 
perhaps married to the mother of the child. So there's this idea that if they're not married to them, that they're an absentee father. So it's like a lot of it is just false, you know, false facts, alternative facts that um, that Africans aren't really don't really check on. It's just the perception. Well, you see, even though, you know, you're talking about marriage, the marriage is on decline all over the United States. You say black men don't want to get married. Now, there's a lot of white men don't want to get married, Hispanic men, whatever, because a lot of these men have realized uh, marriage is a contract. And a lot of these men say the laws that's in family law court is a hundred percent bias against men. It really is. Yeah. And you go for a divorce. They could take everything from you. Matter of fact, in, in a no fault divorce state, a woman could just say, I want to get a divorce, take half everything from me. So some men's like, forget it. I just have a 40 year girlfriend. At least she can't take half of my stuff versus uh, getting married. That's what's going on a lot here in America now. And these laws really need to change. Um, so a lot of the perception from what you're telling me is based off of propaganda and not being educated on the facts. Yeah, absolutely. And then a lot of Africans come here and they just congregate amongst themselves. Cameroonians will hang out with other Cameroonians. Ethiopians will hang out with Ethiopians. You know, my friend, I had a friend, her father, she, she married a black guy and her father was refusing to come to her wedding because she was married to a black guy. Like that's how real it is. So it's like, you just have to put your foot down as a, you know, as a first generation or and for me, I just was like, I don't really care what my parents think I'm gonna do what I wanna do. And that's what a lot of my friends are doing. You know, they date black guys, but they don't tell their parents that, you know, they're 30, damn near 30 years old. And they don't feel comfortable telling their parents that they're even dating, much less dating a black guy is like, what? You know, so it, it, it's, it, you really have to put your foot down and say, you're gonna do what you wanna do, date who you wanna date. Um, and then really show your parents like, this isn't the facts. This isn't what it is. This is just simply your perception. And like you said, a lot of it goes back to the anti-black propaganda that's that's spewed out. And, and Africans, a lot of what they see about black people is just the love and hip hops and the, the VH1 shows that are very entertaining but it's like, we don't think about what that's really doing to our psyche. You know, there are some black people that do get upset as well. Just, and, and I'm pretty sure some of them are going to hear some of this was being said, probably will get upset. And I, and I know where some of the anger could come from because black Americans have fought, shed their blood, sweat, and tears in this nation to gain a lot of freedom that they have. If it wouldn't been for the black American, no African immigrant could step foot in this country. Let's call that what it is. So they come over here and have an attitude, but yet it wouldn't have been for us here. You couldn't step foot in this country. Let's call that what that's it is. True. You know, so the thing is, you may not agree with some things that's happened to us, but at least brother or sister across the water, give us some respect because you wouldn't be here. It wouldn't been for us. Period. You didn't have yeah. a dog sicked on you, the fire hoses, the lynching of the Klan, bombing of your churches, and none of that stuff. That that's how some Black Americans and I feel. Think that that's where part of where the disassociation comes from because, you know, I'm I'm very into Black history and mm -hmm. and I taught at African American psychology. I'm just really into all of that. But a lot of my first generation African friends, the the connection is not there. They didn't experience that their parents didn't experience that they came from a completely different society so i think that it's just kind of like honestly the idea is like oh well my parents came here with no money in their pocket literally the conditions and 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 where these people are coming from are so much worse than any of the worst ghettos here in america the conditions are so much worse than that and my parents came here and they made something of themselves. So why is it that these, you know, why is it the black people can't do the same thing? It, that's the idea because we didn't really see our grandparents and hear stories about what they experienced. So what the blacks in this country and who've been here for generations experienced, we don't quite as Africans, I feel like there's definitely like that disconnect there or there's that apathetic you know, attitude about it. I have a lot of friends who are just kind of like, not really interested in black studies, black history, African-American history. They're just kind of like, uh, I mean, I don't really know a lot about that. And it's like, but it is part of 
who you are, even though it's not maybe Sudanese history or Somali history, but like it, it is black history and you're a black person in America. So I think that, that part, that's part of the reason why is that we didn't really witness or have stories of our grandparents telling that us what they went through in this country. So in our minds, it's not as bad, I guess, as, as it really was because it's like, oh, well, I mean, it's a lot better now. So it's like, what are these, what are black people complaining for? My, my father or my grandfather came here with no, no money in his pocket and now he's whatever. Now he's a doctor, now he's a lawyer, now he's this, now he's that. So I think that that's where a lot of it comes from too. The perception of laziness because Africans come from the conditions are, are in a lot of ways a lot worse than here. And it's it's like the fact that you can come here and make something of yourself, I think gives this disillusion that anyone can transcend racism and that racism is, is not something that will stifle you from being successful. Well, you know, when you talk about, like say the ghettos and stuff like that, once again, most of these people have no education because Black people in, yeah, it, yeah. It, black people in history didn't create neighborhoods. They created whole towns, multiple towns. Black people created because they couldn't be around the white man at all. They created their own schools. They own everything. And really, if you if they was to study history, they realize when they put that crack cocaine. Because yes, they did Gary Webb. I'm pretty sure you know about Gary Webb mm -hmm. uh, and covered that, and they killed him, saying it's a suicide. How you shoot yourself three mm -hmm. times in the head and it's a suicide? Okay, yeah. but anyway, he uncovered. They put that mess in our community, and the crack epidemic is the one that really hit our community hard. Prior to the crack epidemic, we was doing so well, even during segregation, we was doing well uh, family wise. So. If you have to look at that sort of thing, uh, what has happened to us here, but for me, it's not an excuse, but you have to take that into account versus an African person that's not indoctrinated with images of white, this white, that white, 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 white. Everybody over there is black. Either they corrupt, mm -hmm. if they are not, yeah. whatever, but they don't have the same images. So the thing is, yes, I want to, I, I talked to one African brother one time. He was telling me about how the family is and their family is basically how our families used to be here in America, like my grandmother's time. Mm -hmm. So we need to get back to that. And I feel we will with time. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think, um, it's, it's like the, the damage that black people who've been here for generations have experienced is deep and psychological. And it's nothing compared to what Africans who come here experience. The mindset is different, but we've been beaten down psychologically. And we have this idea that everything white is better and that we're, you know, it, it's, I don't want to say it's a victim mentality, but it's like, we've almost, as being a Black person in America, and if you've been here for generations, you may have, in a sense, almost like lost hope. And you feel like a sense of, like despair. And I feel like when, you know, the, the best way to really cripple a person or a group of people is to remove hope and make them feel like they can't transcend their situation. And I feel like a lot of blacks in America feel like that or are starting to feel like that. Whereas Africans, the mindset is different because psychologically we haven't experienced what black people in this country have experienced for decades and centuries. Yeah, but you know, and you're right. A lot of people, some people don't feel hope, but Janice, what I'm seeing, and some people can't see it, I'm seeing this great turnaround of black people in the area of hope, and I'm seeing more of their uh, self esteem coming to light. They're calling out the system for what it is. And as they call this system out and realize that, wait a minute, you're not better than me. Who the hell are you? If it, if they learn their history, Jan, it's like, for instance, I was, you know, doing some more research of, uh, like, for instance, Benjamin Banneker. I'm pretty sure you know about him, correct? No, uh, I don't. Oh, Benjamin Banneker. You wouldn't have NASA if it wasn't been for ben Benjamin Banneker. He's oh. the father of astronomy. Uh, Benjamin Banneker created the first clock. Benjamin Banneker designed Washington, D.C. Benjamin Banneker oh. developed the Farmer's Almanac. All that one black man did, you wouldn't have none of that wouldn't been for a black man. And once black people start realizing how much you contributed to this country, if black people took all the inventions back, Jan Janice, this would be a third world country. 
every, every white supremacist that hate black people, you wouldn't have a heart transplant wouldn't be for black people. Blood transfusion wouldn't be for black people. Closed circuit TV wouldn't be for black people. Yeah. We can go down the line what we have created. And, 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 yeah. and if it wouldn't be for us here, they wouldn't have nothing. That's why when I speak, Janice, and say this country was built and innovated by the black man and black woman, I know this from history, but our people need to know that. And then once they get that, that knowledge, Janice, that's when we change. Yeah. Yeah. So the key is really education mm -hmm. and knowledge and people learning more about history and doing their own independent research because the schools, obviously, this stuff is not things that people are going to learn in school. Going beyond the Harriet Tubman's and the, you know, we learned Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. I think that's all we learned about in school. So, like, really going beyond that and doing your own independent research yes i mean like they they give you in school like and i had jane elliott on the show she said that if you aren't don't come out of school under indoctrinated into white supremacy you didn't learn anything because that's how it's, it's set up mm -hmm. you know that, like yeah. black history month they give the kids mm -hmm. certain people to, to do a book yeah. report on or whatever you want to report, not who you want to. And even Harriet Tubman, all they talk about is the Underground Railroad. They don't talk about how she was a nurse in, yeah. in, in the Civil War. They don't talk about how she was a spy. They don't talk about how she took care of her people. They don't talk about none of that stuff about Harriet Tubman, only that she the Underground Railroad. That's one chapter of that sister's life. So, yeah. you know, Janice, I, I, like I said, I, I think that we do have a ways to go, but I feel that if yeah. more people watch conversations like this it could break the chains that's on our minds yeah because a lot of it the disconnect between the two groups is based off misperceptions you know misperceptions about both groups and then a lack of like you said lack of communication you know and it's it's apparent that african culture is different from black culture but we have so many things in common so i don't really see the purpose in pointing out our differences and you know saying things like oh you ain't black for real which makes you almost feel like other it's like well i'm not white and that's how i felt growing up it's like i'm not white but i don't really feel accepted by the black people because my culture i grew up in is different i grew up around white people well, my parents are African, but it's, it's like, you don't really know where you belong. So it's like, I think, like you said, education on both sides, because Africans are misinformed and have these perceptions of black people that are grossly inaccurate, as you were pointing out. So one of the things is like education. And then another thing is like communicate, having honest conversations and communication like this, which doesn't get to happen often between blacks and Africans and first generationers and all that. Correct. And like I said before, that's what we're trying to do uh, here on this platform. But, but Janice, I, I definitely want to thank you for, you know, joining me on the show today, having this great engaging conversation. Um, is there anything you want to tell people how to get in contact with you at? Um, yes, we can continue the conversation more. Um, all my social media is the same. It's Janice J nice. So J A N I C E J N I C E. Um, that's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Snapchat, YouTube, all of that. So if you, if you just Google it, it'll pull up all of my social media. So thank you so much for having me on the show. Oh, Janice, thank you for coming. So guys, make sure you, if you want to ask her any questions outside of what was said here, make sure to follow her on social media. Please subscribe to her YouTube channel, uh, Janice J nice and see, uh, what prompted some of the conversation today. So uh, Janice, you have a great day and a uh, great week and you stay blessed. Thank you. You too.